Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our website, CompassionateCooks.com. From there, you can check out our cookbooks, The Joy of Vegan Baking and The Vegan Table. You can check out our Compassion in Action CD, our cooking DVD, our podcast sampler CDs, lots of resources and recipes on the website. I also hear from a lot of you asking if I'll be speaking in your town, which is very sweet, but I can travel only so much while trying to get everything else done. Uh, But check out the speaking schedule at CompassionateCooks.com just in case. I update it constantly, so do check back periodically. Also, check out the fabulous perks and benefits of joining the Compassionate Cooks Club. Our membership is growing, and I really do love the idea of having some kind of celebration sometime for members so everyone can meet. Anyway, join the Compassionate Cooks family by joining the club. And finally, don't forget about our other websites, joyofveganbaking.com and vegantable.com, where you can find, among other things, sample recipes from the books. It's a good way to entice your friends and family to check out some new recipes and let them know about the books as well. I'd also like to thank our listener sponsors, though I really don't have much to say by way of feedback from them. Colin Lovis sponsored with a short sweet note thanking me for being, quote, such an eloquent voice for the animals. Thank you, Colin, and thank you for your generosity. Mark Sugro. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Mark signed up his wife, Christy, as a member, telling us that Christy listens to all the podcasts and makes recipes from both cookbooks and declaring that they've all been delicious. Mark said that they're fairly new at being vegan and the podcast has been a tremendous help in making the transition. Thank you. So thank you to both of you and thank you to Nancy Breen. I could not find an email from you, Nancy, but I wanted to thank you nonetheless for your support. If you would like to join the club and support the work of of Compassionate Cooks, you can do so at our website at CompassionateCooks.com. Thank you, everyone, and I look forward to hearing from you. So this episode grew out of the traveling that I do and the fact that when I stay with friends and family, I tend to cook in their kitchens with their kitchen tools. And though I'm very tolerant, it's not my kitchen after all, I've come to realize that I've got some evangelizing to do when it comes to kitchen tools, not just for my sake and the few times I'm in these kitchens, but for the sake of the people I care about, not only in terms of their safety, but also in terms of guiding them towards the things and the tools that will actually entice them to cook. I've had a lot of people in my cooking classes ask, how I can get them excited about cooking. And to tell you the truth, I think it has a lot to do with the tools that you have in your kitchen. If you don't like what you're using to cook, if you don't feel comfortable, or if you find it difficult, or if you find it dangerous, which I'm sure some people do, then you're going to be less inclined to do it. Having the right tools is always essential, whatever the activity. A guitarist doesn't want to play on a crappy guitar. A cyclist doesn't want a crappy bike. A film maker doesn't want a crappy camera. So no matter what the hobby or activity, there are appropriate tools and accoutrements and there are inappropriate or inadequate ones. And I'm telling you right now, if you have less than adequate tools for your kitchen, you are definitely going to be less inclined to be in the kitchen using them to cook. So when we have the right tools in our kitchen, they're key to making it fun, making it easy, making it successful, and making it safe. So I decided to pare it down to five favorite tools of mine. And I don't mean superfluous tools that you can afford to use once you have all the basics. I mean the fundamentals, the essentials that I think every kitchen should have. Just like with our five favorite foods episode, this will have several parts to it. I have others I can add. So don't start writing to me and being like, how come you didn't include this tool? And how come you didn't include that tool? I will get to them. I just wanted to pare it down to five. And I'm going to start with these. If you forced me to, if I had to pare it down to one tool that I think is essential for a kitchen, I highly recommend 
one good chef's knife. And what's really awesome is that you need just one. Okay, two if you want a serrated knife, which is always good to have in the kitchen. But technically, all you really need is one good chef's knife. It's the most important bar none. Now, I honestly have to say that I didn't think I was a food snob would be such a harsh word um until my recent stay at a good friend's house i was there for a week and i was cooking every day and it's when the necessity of writing this episode hit me like a ton of bricks i don't know why it never occurred to me before because i've had similar experiences at other people's houses particularly at <clears throat> my family's houses particularly at my mom's house and my dad's house neither of whom are big cooks and both of whom share a perception that I think a lot of people share that if I don't cook a lot I don't need a lot of fancy tools and equipment or I can get by with this fill in the blank knife cutting board pot etc or I'd rather invest my money in something else rather than in cooking tools but here's what I think I think people would cook more if they had the right tools it's the whole chicken and egg thing yes I'm using the chicken and egg analogy check out my compassionate cliches episode to see why people think they don't need the right tools because they aren't cooking a lot though many of these people do want to know how to cook right? But what they don't know is that they'd be cooking more and properly and more quickly and with more pleasure if they invested in a few good tools. Does that make sense? One thing I've seen a lot in people's houses is one of those cutlery sets, like a, you know, that big block, that wood block, and a bunch of different size knives in that wooden block. A lot of people have them and most people don't know what the different knives are for or that they're using the wrong size knife for various tasks. And I've noticed that these knives are never sharpened. So there's a couple of things to say here. First of all, when you're eating a plant-based diet, because there is no need to devein a shrimp or disjoint a chicken or fillet, which means removing the skin, a fish, or carve a turkey or debone or butterfly or cleave anyone, none of those specialty knives are necessary. You know what I'm saying? So you need one good chef's knife. And there are a lot of really good knives out there. Sometimes it's fun to just go to a cutlery store or a kitchen supply store and feel the different knives to see which one you like best. You can use a six inch or a seven inch or an eight inch. The eight inch blade is my favorite, tends to be my personal favorite. I like the feel of a really large, sturdy, heavy blade in my hand. And I think it takes getting used to if you're not used to it. Um, I still chide my poor husband who will use a tiny knife, like a paring knife, to cut vegetables. I mean, you know, it's enough for like you know, one quick carrot or something, but he will use it to chop and chop and chop. And though I make fun of him, and I try to keep him out of the kitchen as much as possible, I know he's just used to it, and he's not used to cutting with a larger knife. And a large knife can be intimidating. It will feel like a cleaver if you're used to using a knife on the smaller side, but, and I could be getting into really dangerous territory here, it's not just a matter of size, it's a matter of how you use it. And knowing how to use a knife is very important. People have asked me for years to do a class on knife skills. And I just, I've never had the time to organize or teach one. And I know this is extremely necessary because it's really hard to find a vegetables only knife skills class. Most of these classes show you how to eviscerate and carve up animals. So vegetarians are obviously not drawn to these classes, even if they do have a few demonstrations for, for vegetables. They tend to center around meat. So I am super, super, super excited to announce that Compassionate Cooks is now offering a Knife Skills 101 class in San Francisco that I know will be very popular. We already have a number of signups for it. And I'm certain that we'll be offering it again and again. There's so much to learn, not just how to hold a knife, what type of knife to buy, how to clean your knife, how to store your knife, how to sharpen your knife. There's also so much to cover in terms of the different cuts, the difference between dicing and cubing and mincing and slicing and chopping, uh, how to cut a butternut squash without losing a finger, how to chop onions without crying, how to peel ginger or garlic or shallots, how to pit an avocado, how to julienne carrots, how to chiffonade herbs. So there's a lot to cover and I envision this class being offered many times again and again. 
focusing on the basics and then the varying types of cuts um, will feature different different types. And the good news, the good news for me, and in terms of the ability to reach more people, is that I won't be teaching this class. I'm very excited about that. I know I've mentioned the training program I'm creating that will enable Compassionate Cooks to expand um, by training others to teach classes all around the country, all around the world. I mentioned it a while ago here and elsewhere, and many people were very excited about it. Truth be told, after spending a lot of time on it and getting a lot of helpful professional advice, the grand vision I had for it was too lofty and too expensive for just me, for just one person to build. So I had to re-examine it and retool it so that it will work on a much smaller scale and build more slowly. But I am building it slowly. I'm starting with just a couple people, one of whom is a wonderful professionally trained natural chef in San Francisco who interned with me as part of her chef training and who will teach as a Compassionate Cook certified instructor um, in general. And her name is Rebecca, Rebecca Fry, and she's so wonderful. I'm so excited to have her on board. And it's Rebecca who's going to be teaching these knife skills class among other classes. So check out CompassionateCooks.com for information about the where and the when and how to sign up. It's very exciting. I'm very excited, if you can't tell. Now, I have to say that the knives I'm recommending, the knives that I'm about to recommend, should be fine for both right and left-handed people. Many chef's knives are symmetrical, which means that the blade is equally effective on both the right and the left side. So it doesn't matter if you're holding it with your left or your right hand. But there are some blades that are asymmetrical, and those blades tend to favor right-handed folks. So if you're not sure or if you know you need a left-handed knife, then you'll need to look for that specific. I write and eat. I hold a fork and a pen with my left hand um, and I bat and golf lefty, though I don't do these things very often. Um, but I do a lot with my right. I bowl with my right. I mouse with my right. I throw. I brush my teeth. I play tennis. I use tools and I cut both with a knife and with scissors, as many lefties do with my right hand. Um, I don't think I'm technically ambidextrous because it would mean doing all of these things with equal skill with both hands. So I think I'm technically mixed handed. But anyway, I do cut with my right and I'm fine with whatever knife I get, but you may need to poke around a bit if you need to cut with your left hand. The other thing to consider when choosing a knife is knowing the difference between forged and stamped knives, mainly because manufacturers make such a big deal about it so that you understand what the difference is. Here it is in short. A forged knife is made by pounding metal into a specific shape. So you have a big sheet of metal and then you pound it into the shape of a knife. It's then tempered, it's sharpened, and it's finished. The main thing to know is that forged knives will always include a bolster and a tang. A bolster is the center support piece between the blade and the handle, which adds weight and it adds balance to the knife and protection for your fingers. The tang is the portion of the metal enclosed by the handle. Now a full tang is ideal, which means the metal runs the length of the handle. Knives which are fully forged are formed from one piece of metal, which really increases the security, increases the sturdiness, and increases the strength of the knife. So I really like those kinds of knives. Now stamped knives are stamped out of a large sheet of metal. Think of uh, cutting out dough with a cookie cutter. The blade of a stamped knife is fitted into its handle and it's not considered one fluid piece of equipment. And so, thus, stamp knives are typically lighter in weight, which can be a good thing depending on what suits you. They're usually thinner, they're usually smaller, lighter, and they lack the balance and that sturdiness of, of forged knives. So it requires a bit of a firmer grip and more pressure when chopping and mixing. But sometimes I like a lighter knife when I'm chopping a lot of vegetables. So sometimes it's good for that kind of thing. Personally, I find that the difference between the two types of knives is not as important as the weight and the balance of a knife. The main thing, in my opinion, is choosing a knife that feels really good and really secure in your hand, but isn't too heavy and isn't flimsy. So my favorite knives, both of which are forged, uh, though one is heavier and one is lighter, are as follows. As I said, I prefer an 8-inch chef's knife, and one of my favorites is made by Viking. It's the 8-inch Viking chef's knife. 
knife. And this is in my Amazon store. All these things that I'm going to name are in my Amazon store. The knives in particular, you go to CompassionateCooks.com, you click on Buy Kitchen Items and Books, which is under the menu item called Shop. And then once you're there, there are a number of different categories in this store, there's a subsection called uh, kitchen tools and appliances. And then there's a subsection called knives and peelers. That's where you'll find the knife recommendations. I've priced out a number of knives in a number of different places. And I and I think the prices are really good at Amazon, to be honest. If you purchase anything through my Amazon store, of course, Compassionate Cooks gets a little commission. So it's a win-win situation. But I'm not recommending it just because it happens to be in the Amazon store. I was really glad to find it there. And I think the price is really good. If you don't want an 8-inch knife, that's fine. I included a bunch of other Viking knives in different sizes, including a 6-inch. There's a 10-inch. And there's even a 4-inch and a 5-inch paring knife. I also included a serrated bread knife. So, you know, I said one good knife. Again, you know, one good chef's knife, a good serrated bread knife. I like a serrated knife for obviously cutting bread or bagels, that kind of thing. They're also great for cutting tomatoes, and they're really good for cutting cake. I also have a paring knife. You know, again, if you lived without a paring knife, you'll be fine. But a a paring knife, which is just like a small version of a chef's knife, is really good for small jobs like removing the seeds from a jalapeno or cutting small garnishes or peeling or like stemming strawberries, that kind of thing. So I like having a little knife just for that. So in addition to the Viking knives, I also like another knife. It's called the Global Chef's Knife, and this is also in the store. It's eight inches. It's made in Japan. It's lighter than the Viking Chef's Knife, and I will use this when I'm chopping a lot. I mentioned before about liking light knives sometimes as well. It's a great knife. It's super sharp. It's excellent for really clean cuts. Um, So that's the global chef's knife. And I recommend that one too. Now, I don't necessarily think that you need a set. Like I said, I think you just need the chef's knife, a serrated knife and a paring knife if you want. And I do think it's worth investing in 100 or 200 bucks or a little more to have the best tools in your arsenal that you will have forever. And the way to preserve your knives is to know how to store them, how to sharpen them, and how to clean them. That's the way you're going to preserve them and have them forever. So it's worth the investment. So in terms of sharpening, I know there are a lot of fancy sharpeners out there, those that you can attach to your counter, just there are a variety. Personally, I'm partial to the simple steel sharpener. It's it's often just called a steel. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. It's the kind that looks like a long awl without a pointy tip. You can see it on the Amazon store. It's basically a nine inch steel sharpener. And I sharpen my knives this way frequently. I do get them professionally sharpened about every six months or so. We're lucky our local farmer's market has this guy that pulls up with his knife sharpening van and he has all the professional equipment and you shop at the farmer's market, leave your knives with him in the meantime. And when you're done, you come back and you've got these great sharp knives. So if you don't have that in your neighborhood, then find a knife store, find, you know, a a place that will do it for you. In terms of cleaning knives, I never put our knives in the dishwasher. The very high temperatures can damage the blade. I hand wash them, which is a good habit because it ensures that they don't just sit around with food stuck on them. Don't do that. Food residues can damage a blade. And as soon as you wash them with just a little soap and water, dry them with a soft cloth right away and then store them properly. So let's talk about what it means to store your knives properly. The only disadvantage to not getting a whole knife set is that you don't get that wood knife holder that usually comes with it. Fine. You know, I actually included one of those in my store, in the Amazon store. uh, And some people don't like them sitting on a counter because they take up space. The main thing is not putting your knives in a drawer. Um, Aside from the fact that it's dangerous, the blades can also become dull when rubbing against one another in the drawer. And it's really funny because um, I mentioned before I was at this friend's house for a week And I noticed that she had this wood block of like 10 knives or so, and none of the knives were sufficient for cutting. None of them. And I playfully made fun of this fact. And she said, oh, well, there's a bigger knife in that drawer over there. And she proceeded to pull out this really awesome eight inch 
chef's knife and she even had a sharpener so some of you may have some of the proper tools but you're not storing them properly um, or you're not storing them in a way that they're accessible and that's what you want you want these things to be accessible so that you can use them and so I asked my friend why she didn't have this knife in that block with all the other unusable knives and she showed me that it was too tall if with that thing sitting on the counter and then the knife stuck inside because the bottom of the counter, the cabinets, you know, hit it. So it couldn't sit there. So there are other holders you can get. One of the other holders I put on my store, it's very inexpensive. It's one of those magnetic knife holders. So you just affix it to your wall and then you just have your knives sitting up there magnetically. So there are a, a variety of different knife holders, but it's really, really important to use them. Moving on. I do not want to sound like I'm picking on my friends and family, but look, it's been really helpful to see what people are struggling with and to be able to tell you what I think doesn't work and what I think works. Besides people not having the proper knives or storing them properly, the second worst offense I see taking place in the kitchen is not having a proper cutting board. And this would be the second tool I recommend for your kitchen. I won't name any names, but at certain people's houses, I have cut on the worst surfaces ever. It's amazing they can even call these things cutting boards. And it's amazing the people who own these things haven't lost entire fingers like cutting. What I really think is happening though is that they're not cutting. They're not cooking. They're not chopping vegetables. They're not cooking because it's so painfully difficult and it's painfully scary to use inadequate tools such as crappy cutting boards. I'm talking about things like glass cutting boards with pretty designs on them. Not only is glass the worst thing you could cut on because it absolutely ruins your knives, they're also so dangerous because the knife slips so much more easily. Hello, I like to keep all my dishes vegetarian and not get little pieces of my finger chopped up with my vegetables. So keep it vegetarian. Don't use a glass cutting board. And those glass cutting boards also tend to be really small. I'm also one of those people who's partial to pleasing sounds. And I don't know a more horrible, horrible, horrible grating sound than a steel knife crashing down on glass. It's torture. <laughs> then there are those slippery, flexible, plastic quote unquote cutting boards. They're not boards. They're slippery, flexible plastic things. They're horrible for chopping on because again, they so easily slip. I hate these cutting boards. My husband gets into trouble for this too. I, I've got awesome cutting boards here, but he still uses those horrible little plastic things. I don't even know why I haven't gotten rid of them. I just need to get rid of them. I'm not doing him any favors by keeping them around, especially because I'll just come and criticize him for using those boards. But I know the reason he likes them and I know why other people like them. I know that you like being able to cut on this flexible plastic thingy because then once they're chopped, the vegetables are chopped, you can transport them over to the stove and dump the veggies in the pot. I get it. I understand it. I feel your pain. But I don't think it's worth the risk. One of my favorite kitchen tools, and this would be considered number three in our list here, is what's called a pastry scraper or a dough scraper. It's basically a six by four inch piece of stainless steel that has a handle that enables you to scrape up dough or in this case chopped vegetables or chopped herbs or whatever. You slide them onto the scraper and you transport them over to the stove. And like I implied, it's multifunctional. I use it whenever I make bread or pizza or pretzels whenever I'm working with dough because you just slide the scraper right underneath the dough to enable you to easily lift it off the counter or the cutting board. But it also enables you to do this with vegetables. So that's number three. And yes, I've included my favorite dough scraper in my Amazon store. There are a lot to choose from. I like Good Grips is my favorite. And it eliminates the need or the excuse for these flimsy plastic flexible thingies. So get rid of them. All right. I think I've made my point there. Now that's a good segue to talk about another kind of cutting board I recommend against, and that's a plastic cutting board, any plastic cutting board. Now, if you look at different websites out there and ask different people, you will find a lot of opinions about the best cutting board material. And you'll find some experts who recommend non-porous cutting boards, such as plastic or acrylic. I flat out disagree. If you've ever had a plastic cutting board, you'll notice that they're not porous, it's true, but you see every cut and every slice is visible on this thing. Bacteria can definitely get into those grooves. And I think these 
cuts and slices reduce the efficacy of the cut. And I just, I hate the artificiality of it. It just, I hate cutting on plastic. And I feel like I'm cutting little pieces of plastic up into my food. And personally, I don't want to eat plastic. The main reason, however, that experts recommend against using porous cutting boards and recommend plastic and glass gasp is because of food safety. And if you remember from our Lethal Gifts of Livestock episode, foodborne illnesses are a great concern. If you're cooking and cutting up and eating animals, if you keep a vegan kitchen, you don't have to obsess over contaminating your knives and contaminating your cutting board and contaminating your counter. Remember, the foodborne illnesses that we're susceptible to are animal-borne because we're animals, we're not susceptible to plant diseases. So you don't have to keep two different cutting boards and fear for your life or your safety or, you know, getting sick when you're not cooking with raw animal parts and secretions. In a vegan kitchen, the worst thing you might find is aphids in your kale and a borer worm in your corn, and they pose no health risk, though I don't recommend eating them. But rinse them off, right? So my favorite cutting board is bamboo though you can use wood as well. They're both hard. They're both solid. They're both great to cut on, though bamboo is even harder. And of course, bamboo as a crop is more sustainable. Now, even though it would be easier to just say, okay, that's it. Buy some bamboo cutting boards. Um, It's not that simple. I wish it were. But there are a few things I want to say about your cutting board, also preserving your cutting board and, and keeping it safe. The first thing is to look for a cutting board, in my opinion, that's made out of a single solid piece of wood or bamboo. I've seen so many cutting boards crack where the two pieces come together. You know, where where the two pieces come together, they break apart. And it's not an issue if you have one solid piece. And I've seen this with uh, whether you're cutting on it too hard or if you drop it by accident or even if you just kind of lay it down heavily on the counter. I've just seen cutting boards come apart so easily. So you want a solid piece of wood. That's my personal opinion. Number two, uh, just because you find a wood or bamboo cutting board doesn't mean you've gotten the right size. Another friend um, chops or doesn't chop, if you know what I mean, on an adorable pig-shaped cutting board. It's adorable. I love pigs. It's really cute. But it's also really small. It's so frustrating. You can't chop all these vegetables and you just don't have the room. You don't have the space. You don't have the flexibility. So you want a good size cutting board, you know, like a large rectangular cutting board, uh, like 18 inches long, 12 inches high. It's will make all the difference. I, I promise you. So that's also my opinion. Take it or leave it. Another suggestion is don't leave vegetable scraps or water sitting on your cutting board. Clean it right away. Don't argue. Clean it right away. When you leave water or liquid or anything wet on it, it warps the wood, warps the bamboo. Same thing when you wash it. So you just need some soapy water uh, to wash it. You don't need bleach and all these things because you don't have to worry about um, foodborne illnesses. I mean, if you're using raw meat, which I don't suggest you do, that's a greater concern. But just use some soap and water to clean it and then dry it right away. And of course, never immerse it and let it soak in a sink full of water. The wetter it remains, the higher the chances are that it will become warped. If you do have stains on the board, like from beet juices or avocado, if you've left it on the board, which you shouldn't be doing, um, but you can use a little white vinegar with a soft cloth to wipe it off and you wash it and you dry it and that should do the trick for any stains. If your board does become warped and it doesn't sit flatly on your counter, or if you find that it tends to slide, then a good trick is to put a dish towel underneath it and voila, that should take care of any sliding. But if it really becomes so warped that it wobbles every time you cut, then either return it or chuck it. And being wood or bamboo, you should be able to dispose of it in an environmentally friendly way. When you first get your wood or bamboo cutting board, and you can continue to do this for the life of the cutting board, you can prolong its life by actually seasoning it or oiling it. You can use an oil like walnut oil. I wouldn't use mineral oil as a petroleum-based product, and I don't use it, but you can use something like walnut oil that doesn't go rancid. Walnut oil doesn't go rancid as quickly as other oils, so it's a good option for this. And a soft cloth, and you just apply it in the direction of the grain. You can warm the oil, which allows it to to penetrate even deeper into the wood and you can apply four to six coats before using the board it's just an option after a while you can also oil it again if it looks dry 
dry boards crack more easily. And so again, you can do this frequently, you can do it every week, or you can do it every six months, it's up to you. Another way to prevent cracking and drying is by avoiding placing hot pots and hot pans on the boards right off the stove or right from the oven. And I know a lot of people do this because they don't want to put the hot pots or pans directly on their counters. But use those little hot plate things, you know, so that you can put the pots on those. You might not notice right away, but over time, the heat from these things can dry out your board and cause cracking. So that's all I got on cutting boards. Really makes a huge difference. I love my cutting board. So that's number one, one good knife. Number two, uh, bamboo or wood cutting boards number three and you need one I mean I say cutting boards I have I have a couple obviously you know I teach classes and stuff but uh, one good size cutting board should be fine but you might want to get two it's nice to have two if you have friends over or family and you can cut together that's actually a nice option so maybe get one more than one board and a pastry scraper is number three Number four, my fourth favorite kitchen tool, I suppose it's not essential. I mean, you're not going to like die without it or you're not going to not cook without it. But my fourth favorite kitchen tool is a pair of tongs with nylon ends. It was really hard to choose which favorite tool would be number four because I also love my wooden spoons. I have every size and shape and length spoon and I love them, but I love my tongs more. No, not more. I just love my tongs. Uh, But not just any pair of tongs. I really recommend taking good care of your cookware, which is why tongs with non-stick ends are key. You don't want metal tongs scraping and scratching your pots and pans. And not just tongs with nylon ends, but locking tongs with nylon ends. And not just locking tongs with nylon ends, but nine-inch locking tongs with nylon ends. There's so much to consider here. Now, I have a nine-inch pair and a 12 inch pair of tongs. I use the nine very frequently. The 12 I think is good for pulling pasta out of a tall pot or something like that. But I use the nine inch very frequently. And I also love the locking tongs because it makes them so easy to use. And when you lock them closed, you can just store them in the drawer really easily. They, they just lock closed. So I love my tongs. I love them for stir fries. They're great for sautés, for greens, you know, for cooking greens and for serving greens, for tossing pasta, for turning veggie dogs on a grill, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. for plating and serving food, flipping tofu, you name it whatever. Um, I love my tongs. So you can see which ones I like. I have them in my Amazon store. I don't really have much more to say about tongs other than to get them. Love them. So number five, last but certainly not least, is a KitchenAid food processor. Now notice I didn't say food processor. I said KitchenAid food processor. Now if you have a food processor you like and it's not a KitchenAid, that's fine good for you, more power to you. If it works for you, great. I personally hate every other food processor other than a KitchenAid. No, I don't have stock in KitchenAid. And no, they don't pay me to say this, though they should because I've definitely increased their sales over the years. And I know I sound a little strong and I and I really don't like using the word hate, but I really do hate. <laughs> I really do loathe every other food processor I have tried. And I'm talking about consumer-based food processors, okay? I'm sure there are fancy schmancy industrial restaurant grade food processors out there that are just great. Well, I don't have them. I'm just talking about consumer food processors food processors for the people. The main reason I like the KitchenAid food processor so much is because of the dual bowls and the dual blades. Let me explain. Most food processors, like brands who shall remain nameless and Cuisinart, art, have one single bowl. They may have different size machines with the different size bowls, like single size bowls, some small, some large, but that's all you get. You get one machine with one size bowl. You pay a couple hundred dollars and you get one bowl and one blade. Doesn't work for me. The KitchenAid food processor comes with a large bowl and a large blade and then a small bowl and a small blade that fits right into it. Now, most of these food processors also come with all these other specialty blades, and and those are great. So KitchenAid definitely comes with these. So do the others, but that's, that's great. I mean, that's not why I dislike the others. It's because of the single bowl thing. And I don't have a large kitchen. The things that sit on my kitchen counter are my blender, my food processor, and my toaster oven. Those are things that I use 
frequently and they sit on my counter, but I don't have room for like a small food processor and a large food processor. It's just ridiculous. So the large bowl is great for pureeing soups and for chopping large quantities of onions or carrots or for using those specialty blades for the slicing blades and the shredding blades. Um, And the small bowl is great for smaller things like mincing garlic or mincing ginger, making a small batch of hummus or making a quick fruit sauce or that kind of thing, whatever, you know, small batch things. Now, if you have the space for separate machines, then, you know, go for it. You know, you can invite me over to your fancy huge kitchen and you can have every size Cuisinart kitchen food processor you want. But um, I don't have room for that. So go for it or take my suggestion and just check out the KitchenAid food processor. There are other reasons I like the KitchenAid food processor over these other brands, and it mostly has to do with ease of use. When I teach classes at locations where the food processor is provided for me, it's usually a Cuisinart, and it drives me bonkers. I literally need like three assistants to come over and help me put the top on and figure it out. It's so ridiculous. You need like a manual to figure it out. I'll stop complaining because I'm going to get letters from you people who have a Cuisinart food processor. But I know you know what I mean. Even those who have it and like it, I know you know what I mean when I'm talking about this. So that's my last suggestion. For the top five essential kitchen tools, my favorite kitchen tools, and I know some of you are thinking, so do I need a blender and a food processor? My short answer is yes. My long answer is yes, because there are some things that one can do, but the other cannot do. For instance, y'all know that I would die without my fruit smoothies, and you cannot make a smoothie in a food processor, okay? You need a blender for that. So you ask, can I just use my blender for chopping and not get a food processor? Look, you don't technically need a food processor for chopping, right? That's why you have a good knife and a good cutting board, but it does make it a lot easier. It makes it a lot faster, And no, you wouldn't use a blender for that sort of thing. Blenders are made for blending. The blade is all the way at the bottom, which means you don't get even chops. The blade is too large so that you don't get small things like garlic. The blade is fixed to the pitcher, usually making it a pain to clean. And even if you can detach the blade from your pitcher, it's a pain to dis to disassemble and then assemble it every time. With a food processor, it's an absolute breeze. So that's all I got. I'll do another episode uh, of another five favorite kitchen tools, but I do think these are essential. I think the essential ones are the knife and the cutting board. The other things are really helpful and I think make, make it really easy to cook and to cook well. So I hope that helps you in your compassionate cooking endeavors. Check out the Amazon store, get yourself stocked up and get ready for me to show up because if I come and I see crappy knives and crappy cutting boards in your kitchen, I ain't cooking for y'all. I ain't going to do it. So that's it. That's all I got for the animals. This is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening.